Sausalito, California. One of the greatest crowds in the West gathers to witness the launching of a Liberty ship. There is something about this crowd, as there is about this ship, that is different from any other. Something you cannot see, yet something that all who are assembled here can feel. The presence of an unseen, yet vital personality. For the name of this ship is Jack London. Never was a Liberty ship more fittingly named. The fearless spirit and purpose of the man lives again in every member of its crew and invests the ship itself with true significance. For Jack London was more than a great author. He was a real American. He lived and wrote that others might be free. Free to read the truth. Free to right a wrong. Free to raise their voices on behalf of the welfare of their fellow men. she's into it, and the machine smashes her hand. that girls. Lots of times I've almost dozed off and just caught myself in time. It's the rotten air and the noise that never stops. Twelve hours a day beating in your brain. For ten cents. Ten cents an hour. Oh, I know, honey, but things are bad all over. It isn't that, Mammy Jenny. It's, it's just that people like us, poor people, have to work in filthy holes just to exist. And that other people, rich people, can have everything they want. Fine clothes and carriages, and not only things, but time. Time to live, and time to think, and time to learn. That's what I want, Mammy Jenny. Time. I guess you're right, Jack. Mammy Jenny, have, have you got any money? Well, I've got some. Some I've been saving. Don't you lend it to me? What for? I want to get myself a boat. I can make money, lots of them, fast. Jack London, what are you thinking about? Oyster hauling. Oyster hauling? Oyster pirating, you mean? I wouldn't stay at it long, Mammy Jenny. Just a few hauls, and I'd have enough money to last me three months. A whole year, maybe. 
Then I'd be free to get some schooling. Don't you let me hear you talk like that. I have to bring you in this world. And I want to see you grow up right so you'll mount to something. I ain't going to help you get in no trouble. I don't want to get into trouble. I'm trying to get out. Is it wrong to want to fight your way out? I'd pay you back. Every cent, more even. Oh, it ain't with money, darling. You can have all I got. But, but I couldn't sleep nights worrying over you. Oh, Jennifer. If anything would happen to you, I'd never forgive myself. Never mind, Andy Jenny. Forget about it. One seventy, one eighty, two hundred, two twenty, and five makes two hundred and twenty-five. And you get bargain move here. I tell you straight, I hate to give her up. But I got chance to buy bigger boat. I've had my eye on her for a long time. I've been a fool working in those jute mills and canning factories. <laughs> well, come on, let's uh, wet down to deal, all right? <laughs> Mamie, get your stuff off that board. Meet me on the reindeer. No, you don't like that board. Nice, good board. <laughs> Frank, what's that got to do with you? Nothing. Only there's an awful lot to learn about oyster pirates. Who taught you? My brother. He was the best of them. Till he got a bullet in him. You're sort of young looking to be getting a bullet in you. Well, that's the chance you take. Hey, you shouldn't go out tonight. Well, why not? With the moon up? Oh, I'm not going out for rain. Just like to try her out, huh? That's right. When you get a boat of your own, it sort of makes a man out of you, don't it? Sure does. We got some sail patching to do. A rat must have got at this one. Nelson. Hi, Scratch. Hello, Jack. Hi, Mamie. Uh, how have you been? I haven't seen you around lately. Hey, what happened to you? Oh, I, uh, I had a run-in with French Frank over the split. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, a new dress. New everything. You know. Yes, sir. Mamie, the queen of the oyster pirates. <laughs> Come on, let's sit down, huh? Yeah. Jack, you know, I was just wondering, how's about me coming in with you? Why, sure, Scratch. We make enough for a three-way split. Be glad to have you. Only you better talk to my skipper here. Well, what do you say, Mamie? Sure. Why not? Then I'd have somebody to chew the fat with when Shakespeare is writing one of them yarns of his. <laughs> hey, Curly. Double drinks all around for my new partner. Coming up, Jack. We'll have a real blowout after our first big haul. All right, Mamie, tie her off. Uh, 
Oh, we're in first again, Scratch. We ain't been second yet. Here comes Frenchie. <laughs> Coming in on a drag anchor. <laughs> Come on, let's beat him to the market. That's the girl. that one of these days it's gonna be me laid out there in a slam, like a hulk, a dead fish, or worse, a ten-year prison stretch. Life, maybe. Let's go someplace, huh? I can't. What are you gonna do? I'm through with this rotten business. Oh, don't talk like that, honey. You're just downhearted. Now, what happened? And losing your boat. Isn't that? I'm through. What about me? You're gonna choose for yourself. You bet your life I'll choose, if that's the way you are. I'm sorry, but I got to. You're yellow. That's what you are. Quitter! Dirty, stinking quitter! Thirty dollars monthly pound. Sign here and make your mark. Thirty dollars monthly pound. Sign here and make your mark. $30 a month and found, sign here. Well, Tom, old 48. Well, I thought you'd back on that farm. I didn't make it. I'll make it this time, though, you bet. How long is this cruise? About seven months. The Bering Sea. Well, that ain't so long. That's right, Tom. That's right. $30 a month and found, sign your name. $30 a month and found, sign here, make your mark. <laughs> $30 a month and found, signed here. Name? Jack London. Experience? Not very much, sir, but I'm a good sailor. What are you signing on for? Able-bodied seaman. All right. $30 a month and found, signed here, make your mark. He writes fine, just like a girl. $30 a month and found, signed here, make your mark. $30 a month and found, signed here, make your mark. $30 a month and found, signed here, make your mark. How soon we sail, Captain? Oh, you're anxious to sail, eh? Sure am. You just can't wait to tangle with them seals, huh? Down the focus. <laughs> Things in there now. Listen. 
I always want a bunk by the ladder. A magic place. Go ahead. You move. Maybe I'll bunk by the ladder next trip. <laughs> oh, shut up! <laughs> well, if it is an old 40 acres. You mind your own business. Keep your mouth closed. How is the farm? Hello? <laughs> What's that, a Bible? Well, I got a Bible if you want one. What's this about, James? No, it's about men. Darwin's origin of species. For heaven's sake! Hey, mate! We got a professor aboard. Give me that book. You ain't got to be stubborn with your learning, are you? Give me that book. Hey, pick it! <laughs> That's something you won't get out of books. Why don't you leave the boy alone? Let's finish the game. Uh, 300. 20. Good. Killing these poor innocent seals. Only to get a fur coat for some dame. Yeah, who's doing it for dames? We're doing it for dough. You mean we're doing it for dough to put fur on, James? <laughs> right. Well, I got one down in New Orleans, and I'm gonna marry you right after this trip. We're gonna have plenty of kids. Too. That's right, Victor. Yeah, the trouble is you'll never get past the first saloon. Not this trip. Boy, I'm gonna save every cent I make this time. Yeah, like old Tom. He is always going to buy a farm. <laughs> you mind your own business. Shut your big mouth. Yeah, why don't you leave the old man alone? Hey, Victor, come here. Oh, land lover. Greenhorn. Hey, London. What'd you do with that whetstone? I left it at. Well, get it, will you? This knife of mine won't scrape a seal's eyelash. I'm gonna slip a seal on Jack's bounce line. Don't nobody say nothing. We're gonna have a rip for in time. <laughs> Hey, where are you going with that? She's got a date, man. Don't nobody say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty soon, this dirty sealing business will be finished. Then we'll be heading for Yokohama. You ain't never been there, have you, Jack? And what's it like? Just imagine who was here. With a flock of geisha girls swarming all around. Geisha girls, huh? Just like any other girl, only better in some respects. That sure sounds great. I wish it would happen soon. It'll be soon enough. You get an experience coming that you'll never forget. Never. Sure sounds wonderful.
I'd like the kid turn the tables on you. The joke is on you. <laughs> that makes us that way, son. Cooped up here like a lot of animals, doing the same thing day after day, thinking the same things night after night. No wife, no kids, nothing. Just dreams. Pretty soon we'll be back where we started from. And then you'll see. The big tail will go in the night. And the dreams will go in the night, too. Then we'll sign on again and we'll be the same thing all over. Not me. I'm gonna be a writer. What are you gonna write about? Oh, about all this, I guess. Only sometimes I worry about words. I don't know enough about words. Well, keep digging, kid. They'll come to you. And when they do, weed them. Everyone count. I don't know anything about writing stories, but it seems to me it ought to be something like, well, like making a good net. Make every spring and every knot mean something. When you've got them together, make them hold. Make them strong. I hardly ever went to school. There's so much I want to learn. Well, keep that for a kid. Just steer a straight course. Keep that slush light burning. Thank <laughs> you. 
I spent a pleasant evening going over your short story compositions. As usual, I have selected examples from the submissions. And as usual, the author shall remain anonymous. So if the shoe fits, you can hide your consternation behind a poker face. The two stories I have selected represent the extremes in writing. One is fraud, an attempt at whimsy that evaporates into thin air. The other is raw, almost brutal to the point of unbelief. In other words, one of you have tickled a cloud with a feather, and the other has battered good taste with a sledgehammer. <laughs> I shall read from the feather. <laughs> Penelope nibbled at her bonbon. Her thoughts skipped from nothing to nothing. She was in the pink-blue haze. Her mama wafted in and blended with the nothingness. She seemed desperately worried. Penelope, she breathed, have you seen my thimble? <laughs> this made a profound impression on me. I immediately stopped reading and went back to my police gazette. <laughs> I now come to the sledgehammer. Go on, he advised her. Pull the trigger and kill a man. Spatter his brains on the floor and slap a hole in him the size of your fist. That's what killing a man means. <laughs> Excuse me, Professor Hilliard, but since you've made me a horrible example, would you mind discussing my story a little bit? Not at all, then. Not at all. Well, sir, just what is it that's so wrong with my writing? Well, boiled down, I should say too much imagination. Too much exaggeration. After all, you know, London, slap a hole in him the size of a man's fist is... Uh... I saw it happen in a joint in Singapore. You saw it happen? Well, uh, perhaps I shouldn't have brought it up. You see, Professor Hilliard, I've only written about what I saw. It seems to me there's nothing wrong in writing about life and truth. But do you think you'll get very far writing about poverty, cruelty, brutality? It's my experience that they exist, sir. And if I could put them down on paper so people would think about them and try to destroy them, then I'm doing something. Ah, now we're coming to it. Do you want to be a writer or a crusader? Well, I don't know if I'm capable of being either. I knew when I came here that I was different from the rest of you, but that didn't stop me. Your entrance exams almost did, but I crammed myself with what I needed to get by. I knew that I had to dig harder than the next fellow because I'm rough and barren ground. But, sir, I've watched the Chinese cut terraces into a rocky hillside and patiently wait for the rain to wash down silt so things could be planted and made to grow. In a way, I felt that I was like that, that with a little help, I could make the things grow that are inside of me. I learned that a strong back wouldn't take me half as far as a good head if I could develop one. That's why I came here. But, Professor Hilliard, if my great fault lies in writing about what I know and what I've seen, then I'm afraid it's a fault that can't be corrected here. I'm sure you didn't intend to ridicule me, sir. It's perhaps a trick of yours to make me think. Well, sir, the trick has worked. Thank you, Professor Hilliard. You have just witnessed an unusual display. Unusual in that we so seldom meet with it today. The uncommon thing called courage. I would suggest that the rest of you do not try to emulate him. It takes a lot of uh, intestinal fortitude. For which Mr. London undoubtedly has another word. Mammy Jenny, I sent for you to help me pack and store some things. Pack and store? Yeah. What are you talking about? Well, I'm going away, Mammy Jenny. I don't know when I'll be back. Oh, quit being foolish. What about your schooling? What about your writing? There goes most of it. You you mean you burning all them stories you didn't wrote? And rewrote, Mammy Jenny. Not all of them, though. I'm saving some. And one of these days when I'm successful, I'll 
Dig them up out of this trunk and dust them off and send them to the same editors who are turning them down now. They'll buy them when I'm famous and write to tell me how good they are. But, Jack, you got me all mixed up. First you sweat and you grub and you work yourself sick so as you can go to school and learn to write. I'm talking. Just like that. They say you're going away. Where are you going? In the Yukon, Mammy Jenny. Yukon? Where's that? Up north in Alaska. What are you going up there for? To get some money, Mammy Jenny. There's been a gold strike. And with a little luck, I can hit it. And I won't have to worry. I can sit tight and study and read and write what I want to write. Not what a lot of editors and professors expect me to write. But... But how do you know you can do better up there than you can do here? And how are you so sure you ain't biting off more you can chew? I got as much chance as the next fellow. You don't understand, Mammy Jenny. I, I just can't stay around here and be cramped between the jaws of a vice. I've got to get out. I've got to get away. Oh, I just wish I could be sure you wasn't jumping yourself out of the frying pan into the fire. It's so easy to do, Jack. But there's very few people that could jump out of the fire back in the sand again. Nothing could be as bad as the fire that's burning inside of me now. It's trying to burn through. It's got to burn through. Someday, Mammy Jenny, maybe you'll know what I mean. Someday, maybe a lot of people. of Greece, the Isles of Greece. The burning Sappho loved at sand. You know your Byron. Hey, what's the name? Frida Malou. Frida from Athens. Frida, do you remember these famous lines? Oh, maid of Athens, dare we part. Give, oh, give me back my heart. Why don't you stay here for a while? We're stopped. We could have a great time together with Byron and Shelley. Well, maybe I will. Yes, 
see who that is. It's Taco. Hello. You got a minute? Where have you been all day? Well, I got an idea last night from what you were telling me about that mass book. Excuse me. I got an idea last night from what you were telling me about that mass ball, and I wrote a story about it. Of course, it's still rough, but I think I caught something of you in it. I'm going to call it the Scorner of Women. Hey, that doesn't sound bad. Well, here goes. Frida was a Greek girl. At least she purported to be Greek. Her furs were the most magnificent from Chilcoot to St. Michael. Oh, that's overdoing it a bit, isn't it? And her jewels were the envy of every woman. Ready, Miss Malou. All right. Are you going to come and hear my number? Sure. I want to fix this first. Like 80 miles north of here. Oh, but you're not going, are you? Well, sure I am. Oh, listen to me, Chichaco. You haven't got a chance out there. I know this you can gain. You will muck in the grassroots till your heart breaks, till you rot up scurvy on the trail. I know, but... Believe me. In the end, the winner is a loser. All the money comes here. It stays here. Right here, I'm Dawson. Thanks, Frida. I don't think I'm cut out for this stuff. Oh, ideals. Listen, I gave up a million bucks for you last night. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Everything beautiful. Oh, Chichaco. I think of you on the trail for you. Byron and Shelley under the stars. snow come from? And why? Does snow a man in all winter? Keep him from his purpose? <laughs> Frozen hands. See, there's an idea for you. A man commits a crime, evades the police, and escapes to the Yukon. He gets snowed in. He spends the whole winter in solitary confinement. Oh, don't like it, huh? Not good. Well, let's light the lamp and spend a cozy evening working.
Now, if you're a good fellow, I'll let you in on the last two chapters I wrote. Remember where we left off last night? Right in the middle of the big fight. Well, listen to this. In vain, Buck strove to sink his teeth in the neck of the big white dog. Fang clashed fang, and lips were cut and bleeding. But Buck could not penetrate his enemy's guard. Time and time again, he tried for the snow-white throat, where life bubbled near to the surface. Where life bubbled near to the surface. Not a bad phrase, then. What do you say? Hey, you. Buck. Wake up. Aren't you even interested in hearing about yourself? What story you can tell? What a collaborator you'd be. Thank you, Mr. Brett. There's only one little point, Mr. London. Well, I'm not awfully keen about it. Oh? What's that? The title you've chosen. The Call of the Wild? Why, that's a wonderful title. It's the whole idea of the story, sir. I wouldn't change it for the world. A dog reverting to the primitive, just as a human being under hardship and brutality reverts to the wild. Well, it's your baby. I'm only the godfather. <laughs> I'd like to change it for you, Mr. Brent, but that's its name. It was born that. All right, George. Thank you, sir. Well, shall we go? Sometime you must tell me how it was born. Writing like that doesn't come out of nowhere. It came out of the Yukon. And unless I miss my guess, it's going to mark a milestone in American letters. Story about a dog? A dog, huh? Here you are, Mr. Brett. Thank you, Jenny. That's what it's about, sir. Mm, it's about life. You said so yourself. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me if the critics hailed you as the Rudyard Kipling of this country. Kip? He's always been my idol. He was mine, too, until, uh, well, quite recently. Charmian. Why, hello, Mr. Brent. Well, you two must know each other, of course. No, I'm afraid not. Let me introduce you, Mr. Charmian Kittredge, and my favorite author, Mr. Jack London. How do you do, Miss Kittredge? Oh, how do you do? I'll see you later, Mr. Brent. Well. Excuse me for trailing you here, but I had to ask you an important question that it just couldn't wait. I can imagine why you're really here. I want to apologize to you, Mr. London. Apologize? Yes. I... I was in such a hurry to... to... I'm afraid I was a little abrupt on the street just now. Abrupt? I'm glad you didn't notice it. I have to get to work, but I'm happy you gave me the chance to explain that I didn't snub you purposely. Of course you didn't. Why did you snub me? Purposely? But I assure you, I didn't. You snubbed me. Purposely. Believe me, Mr. London, I didn't. Purposely? But everyone says you're going to be a gold mine to the firm. I wouldn't dare snub you. Why, what would Mr. Pratt say? Purposely. Mr. London, if you're not going to believe me... Pardon me, Miss Kittredge. Mr. Brett wants to see you right away. And may I offer a couple of words of advice? What? Don't go. No, no, you stay here. Let me go. I'll explain to him and tell him it's all right as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Mr. London, but I happen to be quite capable of taking care of my own affairs.
you read what you find on other people's desks? I have no compunction about reading my own manuscripts. But I do wish you'd consult me before making additions. Additions? Yes, for instance. Once in 10,000 times, a manuscript appears from an unknown author, which is a masterpiece. The Call of the Wild by Jack London makes a reader's life worth living at last. Thank you, Miss Kittredge. P.S. Unless you want to lose your favorite reader, never introduce me to Mr. London. If he's anything like his book, my heart will stand still when I meet him. I... I wish you'd go. Did Mr. Brett wreck you over the cold? No, it... No, it isn't Mr. Brett. It isn't you. Maybe it's myself. I, I don't think to be... To know what I'm saying, do I? I, I guess I'm babbling. Mr. London, I assure you, I'm not this sort of person at all. I don't know what kind of a person you are, Miss Kittredge. likes me. He doesn't like the way you ride him. Well, I don't like the way he rides me. You know, I don't get it. When I was poor, I rode the rod because I had to. Now I ride a horse and I don't have to. Is that supposed to be an improvement? <laughs> well, Jack, it, it wouldn't matter if you were rich or poor, obscure or famous. You'll always be riding somewhere. You see, you just wrote the books. I read them. I think I know more about you than you know about yourself. You're not like other men. That's not true. You should read the works of Jack London sometime and find out about yourself. No, an ordinary man is content to stay put, but you've got something in you that won't let you rest. Well, it's just that I hate traps. When I was young, I thought poverty was the only trap, and I swore I'd get out of it. Now I find that money can be just as much of a trap. Words can be a trap, too. Have you ever thought of all the people who have been caught in hell by words like... Honor, duty, and love. You mean that you think love is a trap, too? No, I, I didn't mean that. I mean that... I understand. You're afraid for me, aren't you? You're afraid that I'll be the one to be put in the trap. Oh, don't be foolish. I thought you understood about women. Don't you remember, Frona? Your own heroine and daughter of the snows. A girl who makes her own way, daring, courageous, loyal, and understanding. She loved a man. Without that terrible possession, you're like that. I'd like to be. Charmian, when a man and woman meet who are meant for each other, it's like a ship new launched rushing to the sea. The sliding ways rebel, but neither sea nor ship hear them as they rush into each other's lives. Happy New Year, Mary Jenny. It comes only once every hundred years. <laughs> Happy New Century, you mean. That's right, yes. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to see what it got. Oh, that's beautiful, Captain Alice. Just beautiful. <laughs> now, if you're good, I'll be back with a mate to that in a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> No, sir, Captain Allen. In a hundred years, we both going to be wearing golden slippers. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> but, gentlemen, there's never been a century like it. When you think of the progress we've made in culture, in industry, the comforts we enjoy, electric lights, the telephone. And don't forget those horseless carriages. Uh, a friend of mine has one, uh, one longer. And I swear, we must have been whizzing along at 20 miles an hour at least. No doubt about it, Jack. Civilization's darn near reached the apex. The millennium, huh? Not far from it. Well, the 
the way I see it, we've only got one foot out of the Dark Ages. Machines are great, sure, but they only make more things more quickly. There's nothing spiritual about them. You can't change what's in a man's mind or in his heart. You can brag all you want about culture and progress, but what bucks big in a man's mind today is materialism, money. Money out of machines and money out of everything. That's what rules this world today, greed and selfishness, in people and in nations. And before we get through, instead of a millennium, we'll be ringing in a century of tyrants. Oh, Jack. You pessimist. <laughs> right. Good evening, Mama Jenny. Good evening, Mr. Brett. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. How do you do, Mr. Brett? Glad you could come. Hello, Jack. Jack, I took the privilege of bringing a friend of mine, Mr. Kerwin Maxwell. How do you do, Mr. Maxwell? Mr. London, I've been wanting very much to meet you. Oh, well, thank you, sir. Oh, I'll take those, Mammy Jenny. Now you can go back to your decorating. <laughs> yes, sir. You're having quite a shindig, aren't you? Yes, why don't you go in? You know everyone. Jack, Mr. Maxwell would like a word with you privately. Something rather interesting. Oh? You'll forgive my barging in on your party like this. That's quite all right, sir. Glad you could come. Sit down. That one? No, thank you, sir. I'll, I'll stick to these. What I want to talk to you about won't wait. Oh? What is it? How would you like to cover the Boer War for my paper? The Boer War? Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing I'd rather do, but I've never done any newspaper reporting, much less war reporting. Very modest, Mr. London, but I've read your stories. You have the gift of setting down what you see. And that, in my opinion, is the quintessence of good reporting. Oh, thanks. Thanks very much. You have to leave immediately for London. From there, you go to South Africa. What will you say? I'd like to, but... Can you excuse me a moment? Quite a surprise. I hardly know how to tell you. Mr. Maxwell of the Globe has just made me a very flattering offer. Well, that's wonderful. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Gee, he wants me to leave right away for South Africa to, to cover the Boer War. What did you tell him? I, I didn't tell him anything. But you want to go, don't you? It's out of the question, of course, with me postponing all our plans. We'll have all our lives. This will be a great adventure for you. But... Happy New Thank you, sir. Oh, Miss Charlie. Miss Charlie, here's a letter from Mr. Jack. Return address, Port Sand. Oh, He's 
on his way home. Oh. Jim is 16. What's your name for 16? It sure is. Well, lay out some things, Mammy Jim. <laughs> yes, sir. Mark at 9623, please. Good night, Could you please tell me what time does the Cambria get in? Why, the Cambria docked two hours ago. Thank you. I won't have time to change, Mammy Jenny. The boat docked two hours ago. For goodness sake. Just give me my cape. Yes, And my glove. Yes, Oh, and Mammy Jenny, don't forget my purse. <laughs> yes, I knew you'd be. Jack! Oh, Jack. Oh, Jack. Beautiful. I got that at a bazaar in Benares. To tell you the truth, I wasn't going to buy it, but you put up such an awful fuss. I? Everywhere I went, you were right there beside me. Now you really need it. It keeps. Nothing will ever take me away from you again. Nothing, darling. You still want to marry me? Tomorrow? And tonight we celebrate. I just sent a batch of that only yesterday to that outlandish place you was at. Good, and I won't have to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jack, here's a telegram. A telegram? Yes, I just told you about an hour ago. You want these, Mr. Jack? No, thanks, Amy. I won't do it. I won't do it. I tell you, I won't go, Mammy Jenny. I won't go. But this has got to be the last. The past closing time. You want to have me do as me like this? With Mike, we've got to settle this first. There's only one way to settle it. I've been telling you all evening. Get married and raise a house full of kids. Well, how can I do that with a war breaking out? It's ain't our war. We ain't even did it. Uh, but I'm in. They want me to leave in the morning for Japan. A lot of correspondents are going. Jimmy Hare, Fred Palmer, and Richard Harding Day. Oh, I've never seen a war, Mike. You can live your whole life and never see a war. Sure. But what beats me is, if you're brave enough to face a war, why can't you face her and tell her you're going? Mike, in a war, you got a chance. But with a woman? Yeah, I know. You lick before you start. But I gave her my word of honor. And if you go, you lose her. And if you don't go, you lose the war. That's right. That's what I've been telling you all evening. Then we're right back where we started. Night, Mike. Thanks. You've been a big help. Better stay home, Jack, and raise them kids. Now, don't start that again. Two o'clock in the morning to say no? Well, Maxwell's a funny fellow. He 
he, he can't take no like an ordinary person. He kept insisting that it's the chance of my lifetime. Wars are getting scarcer and scarcer. And marriages are getting commoner and commoner. Where well, you can go. It's perfectly obvious I mean nothing to you. Nothing whatsoever. You mean everything. No, it's no use, Jack. If you think I'm going to ruin my life for a man who's blown here and there by every wind of adventure, you're very much mistaken. I won't let you go. Even if I was a little tempted by Maxwell's offer, which I don't admit, you come first. I love you, darling. And I swear I'll never think of leaving you again. Your bank, Mr. Jack, all packed and ready to go. <laughs> of course you're going, Donald. Mr. Maxwell tried to get you at my house. I knew all about it. <laughs> Suddenly breaking their necks to make us comfortable. You can have it. Cases and all. What I'd give for a steamed beer and a corned beef sandwich. Looks like you're going to have it. They're concluding peace negotiations right now. 7,000 miles to Tokyo and nothing to show for it but a nice hot belly for washing rice down with sake. <laughs> <laughs> you can't tell as long as those skirmishes on the Korean border keep up. There's they no don't coming. mean a thing, Dick. Just saber rattling to scare the czar into conceding some point or other. Maybe. And I'll string along with Davis. Russia doesn't want war, that's a cinch. And if these boys want peace, why are they sending troops into Korea? Who said they are? I say they are. I was down at the waterfront this morning. You know what he's talking about, Dick? No, I don't get it. Say, just a minute. What's all the excitement? I have the pleasure to report that our honorable Navy has just sunk the Russian fleet at Port Arthur. <laughs> I believe they're all here. I deeply regret that I cannot grant your minister's request that you be allowed to go to the front at this time. Personally, I have no objection. But unfortunately, such permission must come from a higher official than I have the honor to be. However, I will use my humble persuasion in an effort to make your desires possible. We shall arrange a banquet where perhaps you will meet the official who can grant permission for you to go to Korea. A banquet won't bring us any closer to the front. We're all accredited correspondents, Mr. Hiroshi. All we want to do is get the news and get it back to our paper so the world will know what's going on. Sometimes it is not practical that the world know what is going on. If, for instance, the Russians would have known what was going on, there would have been no Port Arthur. We could not have dealt what you call in your country the first punch. You're a little mixed up, aren't you? You mean sneak punch. The idioms of your country are so quaint, young man. I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do at the moment. Who 
means that young man? One of our new writers. Very brilliant and very popular. Yes. It will be very interesting to follow his career. Hey, Jake, what are they going to do about this? Well, there's no use of arguing about it. We're in the same predicament as the girl who was told she could go swimming, but not to go near the water. Well, I'm going near the water. I don't care what that little sawed-off runt says, permission or no permission, I'm going to Korea. Jack, that's being plain bullheaded. I've been in the game too long. You can't get out of Tokyo without official sanction. Dick, I'll bet you $100 I can get to the front. I'll bet you $100 you won't. You're on. Hey, Jack. Jack,
Let me see that, please. I'm an American war correspondent. Yes, but this is a forbidden zone, and pictures sometimes fall into the wrong hands. Wonderful. Very fast lens, I imagine. Let me congratulate you. Let me congratulate you on your knowledge of my language. You must have spent some time in America. Yes, although I learned my English at Oxford. I am Captain Tanaka. Glad to know you, Captain. My name is Jack London. Oh, I've read some of your books. Very good, too. Oh, well, thank you very much. Now you know I'm not a spy. Where are you going? To the front, if I can persuade someone to give me permission. Perhaps I can arrange it. Meanwhile, it will be a great honor to have you as my guest. Come along. Better try some of this excellent caviar. It will do much for your appetite. No, thank you. This is fine. This is a nice, cozy place you have here, Captain. I believe in comfort, Mr. London. Especially when our enemies are gracious enough to possess good taste. As we go deeper toward Russia, I expect to add to my collection. Is this part of your collection? No, Mr. London. This is a game we've devised, which has become very popular in my country. We call it Sinonde. Sinonde? Literally, that means patient. But you might even call it destiny. Now, this little contrivance here, I call Jungensha, the prophet since it foreshadows coming events. Interesting, is it not? Yes, very interesting, Captain. You see, Mr. London, this is not only the rising sun, it is also a wheel, the center or hub of which is Japan. That's a very unusual map you have there, Captain Tanaka. Yes. Our eventual sphere of influence. Here, I shall show you. You will note that the spokes radiate in all directions from the hub from which they naturally emanate and to which perforce they must converge. If you will be good enough to watch the map, I shall explain more fully. Here is the theater of our present operations. But tomorrow, as you shall see, we will have crossed the Yalu River. And soon we'll have all of Korea. A stepping stone to Manchuria. Manchuria? And then... Mongolia, a land of milk and honey, 200 million tons of timber, a billion tons of iron, two billion tons of coal, enough to last Japan for 70 years. We'll be stronger then, able to move both east and west. You're out to gobble up all Asia. Oh, yes, though not at once. First, we must conquer China. It sounds a little bit incredible. But entirely logical, I assure you. Oh, uh, won't you be seated, Mr. Lander? Thank you. You see, a policy of peace is quite impossible for Japan. England can afford to pursue peace and develop trade relations because she has India and Australia to supply her with foodstuffs. So can America, because of South America and Canada. But in Japan, our food supply decreases in proportion to our population, you understand. If we merely hope to develop trade, we shall be defeated by England and America. 
in the end, we will get nothing. That is a mathematical certainty. We've got to control China. But in order to control China, we will have to crush your country and England. That may take many years, of course. Fifty, a hundred perhaps. But it has all been carefully planned. Scientifically. The rising sun has a destiny. Our expansion is inevitable. This, the taking of Korea, is only the first step, the first act of the drama. But the play is on. The curtain is up. And it will ring down, you'll see, upon a Japanese world. Why are you telling me all this? Why not? You'll not believe it. Not even the European paper. How did he do it? Wait a minute, wait a minute, boys. If you want to hear some good reporting, listen to this. I knew he'd do it. I knew it. Isn't it wonderful? Read it, Mr. Brinkley. Jumped the gun on it. Well, he said he'd do it. Just a cub reporter at that. You know what I suggest, Dick? Yes? That we draw up a petition to the Japanese government, protesting, demanding that London be ordered back from the front, or else that we be granted instant permission to leave. I second that idea. We'll all sign it. You write it out, David. I'm as mortified as the rest of you celebrated war correspondents. Being scooped by a novice. As a matter of fact, I should feel worse having lost a hundred dollars to boot. <laughs> <laughs> we all had the same chance to get to Korea, at the risk of our lives. To my mind, we should draw up a commendation to a very courageous newspaper man. I suppose you're right, if you look at it from that point of view. I propose a toast. As a matter of fact, I've read it in one of London's books. Here's to the man on the trail this night. May his grub hold out. May his matches never misfire. I'll drink here. Yeah. Yeah. Take off of hat. Oh, I'm sorry. In here. How did you get to Korea? By sampan across the Yellow Sea. Danani Chimopo. How did you get past Chimopo? Through the courtesy of Captain Tanaka. Tanaka? Tanaka? Oh, so you. Do not believe you. Well, why don't you ask Captain Tanaka? Lake in Makasanki took down. Why did you take pictures in Nakisaki? Hmm? Why did you take pictures in Nakisaki? I was never in Nakisaki. You know that I'm not in Saki Kishonsa. Also in you. Japanese customs differ from Americans. Therefore, you must not tell any lies. Nikito? Yes. General, it's all true. Good, good. You stay in the jail. Hey, no, wait a minute. Come on, come
them? No. You? of yours, Jack London. Yes? No wonder he was so anxious to get to the front. Why? He's in jail in Finland. He turned out to be a Russian spy. Table blank, please. Ambassador, Mr. Takahiro. You wish to see me, Mr. President? Kindly inform your Makara that I demand the immediate release of Mr. Jack London. I'll convey your suggestion, Mr. President. Napoleon, 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 Sorry, you have been detained. He say, he find out 
You very truthful young man. Na pon be koko. Wa yoi kokange. He say, our most honorable country and your most honorable country always a most honorable friend. Well, that's just dandy. Now tell General Fuji to give me my honorable camera. Nasi hoganashi ikato. common sense, for hard facts, for the truth. Now, who do you suppose is going to swallow this stuff? A big truth is more difficult to swallow than a big lie, but it doesn't make it any the less the truth. I didn't write these articles for fame or money, Mr. Maxwell. I wrote them because I felt it was my patriotic duty, and it's your duty as a publisher to print them. No, I'm sorry, Jack, but I can't. For two reasons. First, you've nothing to substantiate the charges you make against the fans. But I saw it with my own eyes. Japanese treachery, Japanese barbarism. I've told you of the hours I spent listening to Tanaka. An army captain, a madman, most likely. Genghis Khan was a madman, most likely. So was every conqueror down through history. And the second and most important, Japan and this country are friends. Japan is one of this country's best customers. We do billions of dollars worth of business with her, and you insult her at every turn. Well, look, you see here, the Japanese race has embarked on a course of conquest, the goal of which no man knows. That's right. And here, again, the headmen of Japan are dreaming ambitiously in the Napoleonic dream. I say more. What happened at Port Arthur will happen again someday. Will happen here to us. When the Japs beat the Russians, they conquered the white man for the first time in history. And they mean to go on conquering them. Someday the white man's dream bubble of peace with Japan will be punctured. But one country at least won't be surprised. That country will be Russia. She was wakened from her dream. We're still dreaming. Well, Jack, you're a cuckoo. Those sawed off little runs from their paper mache island. Why, we could lick them with one hand tied behind us. But Mr. Maxwell, if Jack feels so strong. Don't argue me. with him, Charmian. I'll get this stuff published. I'll yell it from the rooftops. Come along, dear. All right, you old firebrand. But nobody will believe you. No reason. It's not the truth he's worried about. I told that to him. It's money. Two billion dollars worth of business. Sure, sure. Lull yourself to sleep, then your little brown customer sneaks up and slits your throat. And he says they won't believe me. Maybe they won't believe me. Of course they'll believe you. Darling, everything you write, everything you say, rings with truth. It's real and honest. It's you. It's the spirit of Jack London. I'll always remember. When a man and woman are meant for each other, like the ship new launched, they rush to the sea. The sliding waves rebel, but neither sea nor ship hit them as they rush into each other's life. 